So now we turn to the interesting and very controversial subject of the rapture. I'm not so sure how familiar you are with this particular idea, but it's widely held by millions of Christians around the world. Uh, it's unfortunately, as we're going to see, uh, a, a belief that's open to significant question, but it's the idea that uh, Jesus comes and the whole church will vanish or disappear. Maybe you remember these bumper stickers that used to say, in case of the rapture, this vehicle will be unmanned. I was told later on that there were also bumper stickers that said, in case of the rapture, can I have your car? Maybe you've uh, read uh, one of the Left Behind series, one of the 60 million copies. You can hardly believe how popular this series was. The series begins with the pilot, Captain Steele, flirting with the stewardess, even though he's married, and she comes back to him later in the flight and says, they're gone. What do you mean they're gone? Well, there are people on the plane who have vanished. You see, they've been raptured. All that are left are their clothes and their jewelry on their seat. And so this is a very common view of a group of Christians called technically dispensational premillennialist. Dispensational premillennialist. You might refer to them in colloquial terms as left behind people, right? People who are excited about, who believe this left behind way of thinking. And so now we're going to look at just one aspect, one very important aspect, though, about their view of the end times, and it has to do with the rapture. And we're looking at it in this passage because really the clearest passage, if not the only passage in all of Scripture that deals with the rapture, is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. And so that's why it's a good occasion for us to kind of treat this as a separate discussion worthy of some careful attention and see what exactly the text says. So again, the issue, the issue is not whether I like this idea, okay, uh, the question is what does the text say? Does the Bible support this idea that the church will vanish and disappear for seven years? The idea that Jesus comes, but not all the way to earth, so it doesn't count as actually his coming. He comes first for his saints, takes them to heaven for seven years, during which there's the tribulation, and then he comes back after seven years with his saints, and he sits in a throne in Jerusalem and begins the millennium, begins the thousand-year reign of Christ. He begins the kingdom of God. And it's the rapture that starts this whole big process off, and we need to see now from a grammatical, historical, and theological perspective whether or not it's justified by the teaching of Scripture. So the first evidence I've listed as number one, and there would be no need for me to list it as number one at least, uh, unless there was at least number two, and as we'll see, number three. And I've also conceded something that this evidence is a bit soft, right? It's not the strongest, most obvious, but yet it does have a bearing on this discussion and thereby is worthy of our consideration. So we notice in verse 16, <coughs> Excuse me. We read, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And so we have three phrases here that talk about how Jesus will come back. Now, if you did a word study on these phrases, what would you find? This would be more of a grammatical approach. <coughs> Take the first phrase, with a loud command. Well, that's one Greek word which is used by writers of that day to describe what? A command that a uh, a general might give to his soldiers, or the command that a, that a captain might give to his rowers. And so it clearly is a command. It's given by a person of authority, and it's usually loud. You, know, you can imagine a, a general saying, charge, or a captain saying, row. Right? And that's why uh, most translations translate it not just with a command, but with a loud command. The second thing here mentioned is the voice of an archangel, and it's difficult for me to talk about the decibel level of the voice of an archangel, although I make the plausible observation that if an archangel wanted to be heard, that would probably happen. But notice the third thing here, it talks about Christ coming accompanied by the sound of a trumpet. Now, my uh, son plays a trumpet, and I can assure you that a trumpet is uh, not a quiet instrument. No, a trumpet is quite loud. One trumpet can almost drown out a whole orchestra. And so when you look at these first three phrases, the natural reading, the kind of simple but 
natural understanding is that Jesus' coming will be a public coming. It will be a coming of such uh, visible and audible nature that all people, not just Christians, but non-Christians, will witness and will experience. Now, our left-behind brothers and sisters, our dispensationalist brothers and sisters, would say, well, only Christians will hear the loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the other people, the non-Christians, won't. God will plug their ears or something like that. Well, I guess that's possible, but, of course, the text doesn't say that, and uh, lots of things that are possible aren't always probable or even certain. Well, that's the first soft evidence. Here's now a second evidence that, well, I've labeled it soft, but actually if you've listened to Paul long enough and you recognize that he's a very skilled letter writer, right, then actually the soft evidence is more strong than uh, I think it first appears. First of all, let's, let's, let's clarify what we're talking about. The verb used here is harpazo, harpazo. And this is the main verb uh, behind the whole rapture debate. Now, harpazo is a Greek verb, okay? And then the Greek New Testament was early on translated to Latin. And so then the Greek verb harpazo became the Latin verb rapare. And from the verb rapare, we get the, name, the Latin noun raptus, from which we get the... English noun rapture. All right, so the English word rapture is only found, I guess, in this verse. Even though it technically isn't found in this verse, because it's a Latin translation of the Greek verb harpazo. So we're asking ourselves, okay, Paul used the verb harpazo. What did he mean or intend by the choice of this verb? Now the verb literally means to snatch or to grab, and sometimes uh, things are used of harpazo. Sometimes things are snatched or grabbed in a negative way, like they're stolen. Sometimes they're snatched in a positive way. So there's, there's different shades to uh, this action of harpazo. But a better understanding has to do with how this verb was used in that day in the context of death. Oh, and you say to yourself, actually our passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, is a passage that deals with death, doesn't it? It deals with Christians who have fallen asleep. So the context certainly would fit for this. Well, how was this verb used by non-Christians in that day? Well, it is found on lots of grave inscriptions, and it's found in a bunch of other inscriptions to describe how somebody is harpazoed, how they are snatched from life to death. So there are lots of writings. It's a very common verb used to say oh, this person enjoyed all the benefits of life, family, and friends, but they were harpado. They were snatched from life to death. In fact, after I prepared this PowerPoint presentation, you can see here some references on this slide and also on some funeral inscriptions, uh, a number of other inscriptions. There are many more that I've discovered too. For instance, um, Caesar Augustus, the big emperor himself, he had a res gestae inscription. These are the deeds that he accomplished. He wanted to make sure that everybody knew what he had accomplished, and he had supervised this, this last will and testament, if you will, uh, before he actually died. And in that document, he talks about his two grandsons, right, both of whom he hoped would take over. And he says they were snatched again from life to death. And so what you need to understand, and what I'm trying to say is that this verb or this idea of being snatched was a very common one in that day when referring to death. How either fate or death itself would snatch someone from life and bring them to this new position of death. And if that's the case, then it's possible that Paul, when he chose the word harpazo, he didn't mean literally will be snatched, but he was using it to evoke a kind of counter-cultural message. He was punning or playing on the verb. He says, you Thessalonians and I, we live in a culture where, where people are harpazoed from life to death. But the good news, the comforting news is, we Christians are harpazoed from life, not to death, but from life to new life, to everlasting life, to resurrected life. I hope this is clear to you, right? I mean, we modern preachers are clever enough to have a word play. Why couldn't Paul do the same thing? For instance, if I had a sermon title advertised in the bulletin or on the billboard outside my church, and the sermon title was, Desperate House Husbands. 
I'm anticipating most people would think, oh, desperate house husband. This is a sermon literally about husbands who are desperate. Or, no, they probably would hear, and rightfully so, me making a pun or a play on a terrible television program, right? Desperate housewives. So I'm playing on the word desperate and house something, right? In order to evoke interest and maybe to have a countercultural message. And so in the same way, I think that Paul, when he chooses the word harpazo, it isn't to literally say, oh, Christians will be snatched from earth to the air, right? But Paul is, again, pl cleverly and pastorally comforting them that we'll be snatched not from life to death, but from life to life, or life to eternal life. Well, uh, if you're still not convinced, I'm not too worried because I have my third evidence, and it's not just hard, I've suggested that it's rock hard. And it centers on the meaning of a key word, so it's partly grammatical, but it also centers on how this word revolved a practice, so that makes it historical. And then this word occurs both inside and outside of Scripture. So when I look at the other uses of Scripture, that makes it theological. So now we're bringing in a bunch of things from our hermeneutic to understand this idea of apontasis. Now, let's look at that word apontasis. Now, in the English translation of your Bible, uh, that word doesn't look very significant. It's usually translated as a verb even though it's a noun, so that's already a, a mistake, so to say, right? Because apontasis is a noun, but most English translations treat it as a verb. So our text will say, right, in order to, will be harpazo, will be snatched to apontasis, to meet the Lord in the air. That's how most translations have it. But this word apontasis is a, I might call it a T, -t right? It's a technical term. In other words, Technical terms are words with fixed meanings, very narrow and precise meanings. Words that only have this meaning are consistently used with these fixed, narrow meanings. So then the next real question is, now what is this fixed meaning of the word apontasis? Well, it refers to how if an important figure were coming to your town, right, either a governor or a Roman general, well, the city leaders would gather together and say, oh, Governor so-and-so is coming to our town. This is a huge honor. This is a big deal. And they might pass some uh, official decree recognizing this honor that he's coming. And then what would they do? Well, they would designate a delegation, right? A reception party. A group of people, and by the way, you wouldn't be in them, right? Because this would be restricted to the movers and the shakers, right? The people in the privileged and powerful positions. So this delegation party would be sent down the road to apontasis the person, right? To meet the person. Now, what happens when the delegation or reception party meets this governor, general, or whoever the bigwig may be? Well, they escort that person back to the town that this person was always going to and the town from which they, the members of the delegation party, came. And there's some other things that happen here too in terms of uh, people decked out in their best clothes and the city would have other celebrative kind of things in terms of being cleaned up and so forth, but that's not so important right now. Now, the important idea is an apontasis isn't a regular word. It's a special word. It refers to a special event, an event that the Thessalonians, major city, one of the top ten cities in the ancient world, would have surely seen many times in their life when a bigwig, a governor, or a general came and how a delegation was sent down to apontasis to meet him and then escort him the rest of the way to their town. Now, before we uh, get back to Thessalonians, I share with you that this word, this technical term, apontasis, occurs three times in the New Testament. One of them is our passage, so that means there must be two more. So let's look at those two other meanings, and maybe they'll confirm or contradict this meaning of apontasis that we've already observed. So here we go. So one of the other occurrences is in Matthew 25, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. You can see here the foolish ones are on the one side. You can see the cards and the drinks. That's all the bad vices from that era. And the wise ones are piously waiting on their side with their lamps burning. But anyway, so we read in this parable that the virgins, both wise and foolish, went down the road to apontasis, same word, to meet the bridegroom. Now what happens when they meet the bridegroom? Do they take off with them on the honeymoon? 
No, of course not. The wedding hasn't even happened yet. They escort him to the place he was going, the wedding, the wedding event and the wedding banquet, the place from which they came. The same meaning is found in uh, Acts 28, verse 15. Paul has appealed to Caesar, which as a Roman citizen he's entitled to do, and so off he goes on that boat journey. Things don't go so well, although he ultimately survives. He's getting close to Rome. The Christians there hear that he's coming, and so they say, oh, we should send a delegation down the Via Appia, right, the major Roman road going in and out of Rome. We should send a delegation down to Apontasis to meet Paul. And what happens when they meet Paul? Do they escape with him? Again, of course not. They escort him the rest of his way to the place he was going, namely Rome, the place from which they, the members of the delegation party, came. So it's quite clear that this word, both inside of Scripture and outside of Scripture, has this idea of sending a delegation who receives this dignitary and then escorts them on the last part, the remaining part of their journey. So when we go now to our text, and we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, that we Christians will be harpazoed, will be snatched to what? To apontasis the Lord. Well, think about the imagery here. I think it's quite clear. So we have an image of how the church is, I'll say raptured if you want, but it somehow is joined to the descending, reigning Jesus, and then what happens? If you're a dispensationalist, if you're a left-behind Christian, then you say, well, Jesus does a U-turn, right? So he kind of meets the church, right? And then they all turn around and go back with Jesus to heaven for seven years. But you see, that violates the meaning, the picture, the metaphor that Paul is working with, right? The clear idea is that the church meets the descending and reigning Christ, right? And then what? Escorts Jesus to the place he was always going, earth, the place from which we, the members of the delegation party, came. And so the meaning of this word, both grammatically, historically, and theologically elsewhere in Scripture, is really, uh, really delivers a death blow to this idea that somehow the church will vanish and disappear for seven years, and then after that we come and Jesus sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem and rules for a thousand years and all these other things that are part of this so-called dispensationalist theology. So, in answer to the question, yes, there is a rapture, a joining to Christ, but, um, but the church continues to earth where Jesus, well, where he establishes the new heaven and the new earth. Right? That's when, as Romans 8 puts it, right, the creation is right, which is on labor, is finally delivered, where it's not only believers, humans, who are restored to their former state of perfection, but the creation itself is restored to its former glory. But we perhaps are not quite done, because maybe you know of another text, right? Maybe you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, before we reject that text from Thessalonians, we have this other text from Matthew, right? And uh, they would probably cite just verses 40 and 41. They would say, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other left. And if you look at that, you might say, well, you know, maybe there is something to be said with this rapture after all, because we got two people, one's taken away, right? One maybe is raptured, and the other one is left. And But then you remember, of course, the important principle of everything should be interpreted in its context. And so if we would backtrack, right, and we would see that this saying is introduced by Jesus saying, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus is making a comparison. He said something happened in Noah's day, and that's what it'll be kind of like. Doesn't mean it'll be exactly like, but it'll be kind of like this when the Son of Man comes. So what happened in Noah's day? Well, in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving up in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. So, you have to ask yourself now, who are the they who know nothing about what would happen until the flood came, and who are the them who are taken away? Well, the clear answer from the context is, all those people eating and drinking, marrying and giving up in marriage, right? All the non-believers. Then we read, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. 
Two men will be in the field. One will be taken. Now be careful. One will be taken like those eating and drinking in Noah's day who didn't know what would be happening. They were taken away in the flood for destruction. And one will be left, just like Noah and his family. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken like those of Noah's day who were eating and drinking and partying and didn't know what was going on and were taken away by the flood. And the other left like Noah and his family. And so when you look at that in its context, you reach the conclusion you want to be left behind, right? Because Noah and his family were left behind, and they're the only ones who survived God's justified wrath in the flood. And so this other text, right, where we compare what one passage in Scripture says perhaps about the rapture, 1 Thessalonians, when you compare with what another passage says about the rapture, Although I hope you see there's hard to get any kind of rapture teaching much out of this ever so brief reference. But you can see that there is some consistency in this interpretation. So when I come now to the question, what about the rapture? Would you say that it is a biblical truth or would you say that it's a mistaken teaching? And I have a yes and no answer to that. Not because I'm wishy-washy, but I want to be precise and say only what Scripture allows me to say and reject anything that Scripture doesn't support. So I would say yes, the Bible teaches that the church will somehow be joined to Jesus when he comes again. If you want to use the word rapture for that, harpazo, that's okay with me. Somehow the church at the end of time will be joined to Jesus. And that raises an important question, of course, where you will be when Jesus comes again. Will you be with the church? Will you be with those gathered together, right, the bride and the bridegroom? Or will you be with those who are, in a bad sense, a true sense, left behind? But I don't see in this passage or anywhere else in Scripture the idea that once we're joined to Christ, once we're even, if you want to say, raptured to Jesus, that again, we go to heaven for seven years, the marriage feast of the Lamb, the tribulation takes place during that time, Jesus comes back, kicks out the man of lawlessness out of his seat in the temple in Jerusalem, ushers in the thousand-year reign of Jesus, there's all kinds of deaths and resurrections, and then some other final events. The Scriptures don't support that kind of not only rapture, but also a view of uh, of the end times. Well, friends, uh, I hope you can see from this discussion not only, again, the Bible's teaching on this subject of the rapture, but how important it is for us to treat every passage from a proper perspective, and how when we treat a text grammatically and literarily and historically and theologically, foolish interpretations or interpretations that are weak, have no business being on the table, are quickly gotten rid of, and what remains is not only the true meaning of Scripture, but also, I think, along with that, a sense of confidence. So that when you get into the classroom or you get behind the pulpit, you know, you don't say, I just feel, or it just seems to me. But instead, you can confidently say, thus says the Lord. Thanks for your time and attention.